Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Hollywood and History. Um, I'm uh, basking in the glory of some very incredible, uh, intelligent, uh, smart people that Armin's brought into my life. And today we have another one, uh, Professor Michael Basler from Chapman University. Without further ado, I'm just going gonna, gonna to let Armin handle this, uh, this discussion. Apparently, they have a little bit of history. They go back a little way. So uh, it's nice to meet you, Professor. And uh, go ahead, Armin. Introduce him. Great. Thank you very much, Michael. And just for purposes of clarity, I will be referring to you as Michael and to the professor as Misha, because as you said, we have a, a little bit of a history. So as Michael mentioned a little bit earlier, Michael Basler is professor of law at Chapman University over in sunny Southern California and the 1939 law scholar in Holocaust and human rights studies. Professor Basler is the author of seven books and more than two dozen law review articles, book chapters and essays on subjects covering law and the Holocaust restitution following genocide and other mass atrocities, public international law, international human rights law, and international trade law and comparative law. He is the author of Holocaust Justice, The Battle for Restitution in America's Court, which came out by New York University Press in 2003, and Holocaust, Genocide, and the Law, A Quest for Justice in a Post-Holocaust World, published by Oxford University Press in 2016. His work has also appeared in numerous journals and reviews. He is holder of previous fellowships at Harvard Law School and the United States Holocaust Mu uh, Memorial Museum here in Washington, DC. In fall 2006, he was a research fellow at the Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, the Holocaust Martyrs and Heroes Remembrance Authority of Israel, and the holder of the Baron Friedrich Karl von Oppenheim Chair for the Study of Racism, Antisemitism, and the Holocaust. Misha? I'm very, very happy to be here. Thank you. All right. So our friendship does go quite a bit back. I happen to have a very interesting memory where I can remember details to the weather, uh, the locale, the venue, who was there. Would you happen to remember when you and I first met? I'm not trying to put you in the spot. <laughs> yeah, remind me, please. It's so, been, seems like we've known each other for forever and a long time. It does seem like when, uh, when I was thinking about it, too, it's been close to 10 years, if I'm not mistaken. So December 2010, at this restaurant in Studio City in uh, Southern California, and it was when the law firm that I once used to work for had filed the case for injury leak. And this was a, a case which, of course, for those who don't know, was meant to, uh, was filed by Armenian Americans in 2010 in order to uh, uh, obtain restitution for properties confiscated by the Ottoman government during the Armenian genocide. Is that? Yes, I do remember that I, I, very well. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And this was uh, a meeting we had uh, with my dear friend, my late dear friend, and your late dear friend and your boss, uh, Vaika Sigayan. Um, I had been working on Holocaust restitution cases, um, mostly as a law professor, the professor from the ivory tower writing about it, kind of being the neutral voice and explaining what they're about. And I got a call from Vaikas saying that um, I represent um, heirs of those who are uh, victims of the Armenian genocide. And I yeah, obviously I knew about the Armenian genocide is something I remembered learning for the first time when I was an undergraduate at UCLA you know, in the 1970s and on Bruin Walk, you know, there was April, in a, April 24th, you know, there was posters and I, that's when I learned about the atrocities. I still remember the, the gruesome photos that were shown. Um, but to me, that historical connection between the genocide of the Jews, what we know, you know, is the Holocaust and the Armenian genocide. Uh, I never really put that together or the parallels, both in the murder and the theft. Um, I say now when I uh, speak on the subject that part and parcel of every genocide is not just mass murder, but mass theft. And uh, Armin, from you and from Varkas, and you know now through my research, I've learned so much um, 
about the Armenian genocide, but specifically the portion, which is the theft and how much was stolen and how it's still dispersed you know, throughout the world and how much still has not been given back to the Armenian people. Um, and this was a case in which, to me, again, I was just amazed, aghast, that the United States um, had a NATO base in Turkey where you and Vodkas were showing me that look at the plot of land where the base is, and this belonged to Armenian farmers. This was their land. And you can take that, the outlines of the base, and you literally showed this to me, and put it on an old map of the landies of the Armenians that own that land and how it's there. And then we did some more research and again, this denial of history and at the same kind of recognition that the website for the Angelic base, and it's like an American city, you know, in Turkey, because it has so many people, Americans living there, said when you get out of the base and you want to look at some tourist sites, these are some of the, you know, Armenian sites. So it's like sites of the lost people, like you imagine doing anthropology, right? And you go through, look at the skeletons or look at stuff that's there. Nothing, nothing about the Armenian genocide. So um, it, it, to me, it was this um, coming together of both lost history, memory, and, and denial of that history. Um, and the fact that this looting and the theft um, still has not been compensated for to this very day. Um, we filed a lawsuit um, on behalf of the claimants, the heirs to this land um, in the United States. Uh, so far, we have been unsuccessful. The case went up to the Ninth Circuit. Um, in, unfortunately, the American legal system, for a variety of reasons, um, has not been very friendly to the Armenians, Armenian genocide um, property restitution litigation. And I'm very sad about that. But we're not giving up. Yeah, obviously, what you just said, Misha, is a lot to unpack there. Let me ask you a question. And this, I think, would be something which would interest both our you know, viewers and listeners. You know, how exactly did you come to the subject of you know, law or your dis uh, choice to become a lawyer and uh, ultimately a professor? Was, if you maybe could tell us a little bit about your family background. I am the son of Holocaust survivors. Um, my we're, you know, family's Jewish. My dad was a teenager in uh, Poland when Nazi Germany attacked Poland, and he fled. He was the only one that survived. His entire family was murdered. I never met any of my grandparents or siblings. Um, and he had the good fortune, and I say this ironically, to flee to the Soviet um, occupied part of Poland on the east. And he was arrested by the NKVD, the predecessor to the KGB. And I say good fortune because he was arrested and sent to Siberia where he almost died you know, in a gulag. But if he stayed in that part of Poland, he surely would have been murdered when the Nazis attacked that part of Poland in 1941. My mom in 1941 was living in the Ukraine um, so when the Nazi armies, the German armies, decimated uh, the Russian army and went through, you know, through the Poland, they went to the Soviet Union and she was in Ukraine. And she also tells the story of fleeing, but fleeing with her family and uh, eventually making her way to Uzbekistan, uh, which is in the far east of the Soviet Union where many of the refugees fled, you know, for safety. Uh, my dad was in a Serbian labor camp in the Gulag. And the story that I know is that he was freed after the war ended and went from a very cold climate in Siberia to a warmer climate in Uzbekistan. And that's where my parents met and married. And I was born uh, and my siblings were born. And then since my dad was Polish, a Polish patriot and had retained his Polish citizenship, we were able to, in 1957, when I was five, um, for my dad to return to Poland and to bring his family. 
So we went from communist Soviet Union to communist Poland. And then as refugees in 1964, uh, through a refugee, Jewish refugee agency, uh, we came to the United States. So I came as an immigrant at age 11, not speaking any English. I call my hometown Minneapolis, Minnesota, because that's where we landed. That's where the refugee agency placed us. And to this day, I proudly say that I root for the Minnesota Twins. <laughs> um, I could, if I could get up, I'll show you my Twins hat that I have over here. Unfortunately, they didn't make the World Series this year, but I am Los Angeles, so I'm glad for the Dodgers. But yep. I say this only to say because that's how I became an American. My children kid me and say, oh, yeah, that's where you learn about toast and cornflakes and you know, all the things that become make you an American. Um, with regard to law, my mother was a lawyer in the Soviet Union, and I guess that was something that interested me. I've always was interested in um, international relations, political science. I graduated as an undergraduate at UCLA. I went to law school at USC, and I kind of felt that law was a way to, um, to make a better world. Um, I was a litigator after graduation from law school for a couple of years. I worked for the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. I then worked for a large law firm. And then I always loved the academia. So as a very young professor, I became a professor at Loyola Law School. Um, at that time, I was younger than many of my students. And I once <laughs> moved into teaching. The very first thing I did is I grew a beard so I could look myself look older. And at that point, my beard was not white. If I grow it now, it was completely black. But I enjoyed teaching very much. Loyola didn't have openings for any international law professors. I was just a visitor for a year. So then I switched to Whittier College, where I was a law professor for 25 years. And I taught international law, comparative law, human rights. I created a course on uh, Holocaust genocide in the law. And then in 2008, I moved to Chapman University. Uh, also, in, in, by that time, Whittier College of Law School moved to Orange County. So I moved to Chapman University in Orange County because they have a Holocaust center and Holocaust and genocide. Um, so um, it felt like a better fit for me. And so I now, I'm just one lonely professor working at the law school. There's a whole um, center that we have at Chapman University. And that's been my home, you know, for the last 12 years. Um, and I practice law in addition to teaching full time. And the, and the cases, what I mean by practicing is I'm a legal advisor um, to various lawsuits involving litigation um, against foreign countries or against private entities that somehow profited uh, from massive human rights abuses, uh, atrocities like genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes. So I write about it, I teach about it. Um, I can proudly say I testified in Congress on this issue and I've actually been quoted by the United States Supreme Court in a couple of opinions um, dealing with Holocaust restitution when they made it to the Supreme Court. So I'm very, very grateful and that I, the kind of line, line of work I've chosen um, gives me so much satisfaction and I can teach the next generation of students, uh, whether they're Jewish Americans or Armenian Americans or just Americans, Americans, whatever slash you want to put next to it. We're all working for a better world. And um, in my mind, it's the young law students who will be the leaders, no matter what country they're from. You know, there's a reason why Barack Obama, Harvard law grad, Hillary Clinton, Yale law grad, Bill Clinton, Yale law grad, or any other of our presidents, you know, the large, largest category of them are lawyers. And if you look at other countries, whether it's people in Armenia that are presidents, prime ministers, or in, you know, in, in uh, the Armenian parliament or anywhere in the world, so many of them have law degrees. So law can be used uh, for the good. Let me also add, the law can be used for the bad. Uh, the Nazis could not have committed um, the Holocaust of the Jews without having a legal veneer. And as you know, Armin, um, 
that Ottoman Turkey also tried to put a legal veneer over everything they were doing, whether it was the killing or it was the massive theft, that it was all legal under some decree, some rule uh, that allowed them to do so. Thank you. Let me actually use that as a question that I'd like us to transition into. Normally in the, the structure of the other interviews that we've done, I always bring up the topic of Soho Montilleria and toward the end, but I think it might be appropriate to introduce him here because of course you're familiar with his case. I thought maybe you can offer some comments or perhaps offer your take on Tellurian and his importance in the area of international human rights law, if that may be the, uh, the apt way of putting it, and how his case inspired Raphael Lemkin. And maybe we can use that to then talk about the, the Holocaust litigation cases that were brought first brought in American courts in the 1990s. Sure. So Raphael Lemkin, for those of you that don't know, was, was a, um, a Jewish, a Polish Jewish lawyer um, who uh, lived in, in Warsaw, um, was quite distinguished, went to international conferences um, before World War II, talking about the need of creating an international crime for which individuals could be responsible for when they commit genocide. He didn't um, use the word genocide then. Uh, he used other names. And when he went to these conferences before the League of Nations and other places, nobody would listen to him. You know, World War I was over, the Great War, the war to end all wars. And, um, but he kept talking about this. And he realized that, that in these various countries where there are minorities, those minorities were slaughtered in the past and they could be slaughtered again. And um, little did he know in 1939, just like what happened to my father, and when the Germans invaded, um, Lemkin was an adult. He was in the Polish army. His entire family was murdered except for one brother who also fled to Poland, from Poland to Eastern Poland like my dad and, and survived. Um, but then Lemkin was lucky. He was able to flee Poland, eventually made his way to the United States, taught at Duke University, worked for the US government. And in 1944, he published a book, um, Axis Rule, A-X-I-X, uh, in occupied Europe. Um, this is the Germans. And what Lemkin had looked at as a lawyer is how the Germans were using the law in the legal systems of other countries in order to prosecute Jews, but other the other conquered peoples. And in chapter nine of that book, he said, what I'm seeing is, is a crime for which there has to be a name. And he came up with a name. He invented this word, genocide. He put together, you know, from classical Greek, classical Latin, the two words, and genos, which is people from Greek, side, which is murder, like homicide, suicide, and genos, so the killing of a group of people. And that's when the word came into being. When I teach this to my students, they say, oh, they think that it, this is something that was around since, I don't know, classical Latin or Greek. And they don't realize that word itself did not exist until 1944. And in doing that, Lemkin looked at, and when he was a, going back to when he was a student in pre-war Poland, he became aware of the Armenian genocide. And he actually questioned his teachers. How could it be that a, a, you know, a country, a rulers of a country could decimate the entire population, minority population of his people? And his, his teacher, his international law professor said, that's not the concern of international law. A country can do whatever it wants to its people. It's like, you know, if a farmer wants to slaughter his own chickens. And you know, Lemkin's answer was that people are not chickens. You don't have that right. And so he was very much affected by that. He was very much affected by the trial in Berlin um, that occurred of Solomon. And so that played an, an important impact on him. And so when he coined the word genocide, and when he taught about it before the war, he was talking about 
historical events. When he wrote about it in 1944, he was not just thinking about the Armenians um, and other victims of mass atrocities you know, throughout uh, human history, but now his own people, the Jews, who again being, were being slaughtered. So there's a direct line between the Armenian genocide you know, and um, the Holocaust between Mr. Lemkin, our hero, Mr. Lemkin, um, to both hero to international law, to the Jewish people, to the Armenian people, and I think to all of humanity. Thank you. And of course, many people are familiar with the, the Nuremberg trials, which were established in Germany after the end of the Second World War and conducted by the Allies, as well as the war crimes tribunals that were held, I believe, in Tokyo uh, to try Japanese war criminals, again, by the Allies. This was one measure of justice that the Allies tried to implement during this period, but that was pertaining to a multitude of crimes, correct? Not just necessarily what had uh, been implemented against Jews. What efforts did Jews try to, uh, Jewish survivors of the Holocaust try to advocate or propose in the aftermath of the Holocaust? And how did that ultimately transition into legal cases that were being filed in the United States of all countries? You're asking a very, very rich question, <laughs> which I could give a two hour lecture. <laughs> and it's something that I'm very passionate about. Uh, let me explain it this way. And whatever of these points that I make, Armin, if there's any particular strand you want to pick up, you let me know and we'll talk more about it. Okay. So the Nuremberg trials um, were trials that the Allies put together in the German city of Nuremberg to try the top Nazi war criminals um, before an international court, the International Military Tribunal. And this was for what we call individual criminal responsibility. These are the people on the dock. They were indicted for certain crimes. They had to plead schuldig or nicht schuldig, guilty or not guilty, and all of them pled nicht schuldig. And the crimes that they were indicted for were not murder under German law or Polish law or any of the laws where the crimes were committed, but international law. They were tried for war crimes, crimes against humanity, um, and um, conspiracy. And they were put on trial for those crimes. Um, they were found guilty of those crimes. There was a trial that took started, we're now celebrating, commemorating the 75th anniversary. So next month, November 20th, will be the 75th anniversary of the start of the Nuremberg trials, where the top Nazis were put on trial. Hermann Goering being the top one. As we know, Hitler committed suicide. Other top Nazis committed suicide. But the ones that could capture were put on trial. That trial lasted for over a year. Uh, the, most of the individuals, the 22 people on the dock, 19 were found guilty. 22 were actually acquitted. It doesn't mean they didn't commit the crimes. It means that the, three, the judges found that under the criminal standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, that for these particular crimes that they were indicted for, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and then what was called at the tribunal the supreme time crime, which I didn't mention, uh, which is crime of the war of aggression. You know, not a defensive war, but the aggression of one country against another, and the leaders who did the crime of aggression. That those on the dock, three of them, there wasn't enough proof. That doesn't mean those three individuals were not later tried by the German courts for crimes under German law. But after that, there were a set of 12 trials of the lesser known Nazis before American judges, also in Nuremberg. And then afterwards, there were trials in Germany and other countries. One top Nazi that was not there at the dock in Nuremberg, but that was talked about, was in hiding, and that was Adolf Eichmann, who was working for the SS, and he was the only one that was sort of the, the Jewish specialist 
So if we point to one person who executed on the ground the plans, it would be Adolf Eichmann. And he escaped eventually to Argentina. He was captured by the Israelis in 1961 and brought to Israel, where he was put on trial. And that trial took place from 1961 to 1962. And uh, this truly was a trial of the Holocaust. Um, the Nuremberg trials, uh, the murder of the Jews, the theft of Jewish property, it was in the background. But that was not you know, the highlight of the trial. Um, the Eichmann trial, there was. There's another element here that's important. And this is something that a son of survivors, to me, I have to say, goes to my guts. And that is the idea of the, the injustice that occurs when millions of people are murdered, whether it's your own people, other people, and that the perpetrators get away from, you know, with it scot-free and what can be done. And there's a sense of honor and justice, the fact that Eichmann was captured um, the Mossad agents could have just assassinated him. They didn't. They brought him over for trial. And it was not a show trial. It was a trial to show what the atrocities were. And it was done before three Israeli judges. He got all the due process that he asked for, including a German lawyer that came who defended him and appealed all the way to the Israeli Supreme Court. He, had, in fact, was acquitted of some of the minor charges because the Israeli judge says, said our prosecution didn't prove these particular uh, charges under um, um, beyond a reasonable doubt. But the idea of, uh, and vengeance is a very strong word, but the idea of vengeance, of kind of righting the wrong that exists there uh, has always appealed to me as a topic. So I've looked at also of Holocaust survivors who came out of the camps, who realized the injustice of all these top-ranking Nazis who were either hiding or were let go, or even if they were convicted because of the Cold War, were then allowed to go free because we now needed these Germans as a bulwark against Cold War you know, defense against the Soviet Union, and how some of those individuals took the law into their own hands. You know? And so, you know, as, as the Berlin trial pointed out, you know, as the chief defendant, you know, the, pointed out, I, you know, I killed the person, but I did not commit murder. And that's what these individuals felt the same way. And so they, there were some attempts in order to avenge the deaths, you know, of the 6 million Jews and what were happening. Um, and um, I think that that sense of justice um, that occurred in that courtroom in Berlin with the acquittal um, you know, is a very important point in history that I think more people should know about uh, because it's part and parcel of bringing international law perpetrators, mass perpetrators to justice, um, how to do it, and what to do with the people who are victims and the heirs of the victims and how to, how to get a, what we call in the world of Holocaust restitution, a measure of justice, just a measure, or uh, what we call imperfect justice. Uh, fast forward to the 1990s, stage two of Holocaust justice came about, and that's to try to deal with the thefts that occurred. Um, people wondered, why wasn't until 1990s, you know, World War II ended in 1945, uh, Abraham, Abraham Fox, Foxman, F-O-X-M-A-N, who was a Holocaust survivor, he was hidden by his Catholic nanny, later on came to America, became a lawyer, became the head of the Anti-Defamation League. When he was asked that question in the 1990s, I think he gave a very wise answer. And he said that, you know, when we got together after the war, we were not talking about the property that was stolen. We were talking about the, the aunt, the uncle, the brother and sister that no longer was there. And so we were not talking about the theft. It would almost seem obscene to talk about the material losses. So it took a while to kind of catch up with that. It was not until the 1990s, until the fall of the Soviet Union, until the archives were open, uh, until claims were being made as the last set of Holocaust survivors were dying, 
the claims now were being made against Swiss banks who profited from the Holocaust. You know, the marquee German car companies, other companies, the US slave laborers, insurance companies who sold insurance, life insurance policies to, the, uh, to Jews. And when the um, heirs who survived the Holocaust came and said, um, here's a policy you issued to my father. My father died in Auschwitz. The insurance company would say, well, that's interesting. You're here. How do you know your, your father died? Show us the, the, the death certificate. Which is, the answer is they didn't give out death certificates to Auschwitz victims, just like the Turks didn't give death certificates to those they murdered you know, than the Armenian genocide. But it was that connection and a story, as you know, that Vodka Sigayan read in the memoirs of Mr. Morgenthau, who said that when he met the perpetrators, you know, Talat Pasha, who said, oh, by the way, you know, New York Life, your insurance company sold all these policies to Armenians, but they're dead now. So now, you know, if someone, there's no heirs, who inherits by law? The state. So we're the state. So we get to inherit. And Ambassador Morgan thought it was just an obscene statement. But because he made that notation, we talked about a memoir, memoirs. Vargas looked at this and said, here is justice that we can do this. And again, I'm paraphrasing, but in an interview with the Los Angeles Times, he said, look, on April 24th, we go to church and we commemorate you know, we grieve about what happened. I want to take the next step after grieving. And I want to put some of the wrongs, the material wrongs, uh, put it to, just, you know, to justice. We can't bring those that were murdered, even those that survived in the Armenian genocide, they're no longer alive. But with the property that was stolen from the Armenian people that is part of the patrimony of the Armenian people, does not belong to the perpetrators or does and doesn't belong to the individuals or the heirs who knew that they were inheriting, contributing, getting stolen property. Yeah, and I mean, that was just a very memorable phrase which Varkas coined too. Uh, I think it went uh, lamentation, liturgy, litigation, and uh, I remember that him repeating that phrase many times. So, of course, uh, Farkas took the example of the, the Holocaust restitution cases from the 90s to apply for the Armenian genocide. And I thought maybe you could briefly tell us what was the, what sort of challenges did Armenians face in bringing these kinds of suits? What is that, uh, 75 years after the genocide uh, in the American uh, court system, and maybe you can even mention why exactly would the American court system be much better suited than, say, France's or another country's uh, legal system? Sure. So the quick answer to this is, uh, just like in life, timing is everything. In litigation, timing is everything. And we're talking about the 1990s um, with a different presidential administration. Bill Clinton was president at the time. Um, he appointed a special Holocaust envoy, Ambassador Stuart Eisenstadt, um, who became the point man uh, to try to negotiate agreements um, with the German companies, with Germany, with various other countries, and companies who profited from the Holocaust. And so the environment was ripe for that. And Varkas has the wherewithal the, I want to say the genius, I want to say really the genius, to say this can be applied to Armenian litigation. You know, so lamentation, liturgy, and litigation. And so he wanted to file the lawsuit, and he found here living in Southern California, home of the largest Armenian community outside of Armenia, of individuals who had copies of those policies that were issued by an American company, New York Life. I happen to have a life insurance policy today from New York Life. That, you know, and upon my death, my children were, you know, are the beneficiaries. And so these beneficiaries were still alive. They actually had copies of the policies that were issued to these um, uh, to the Armenians in Ottoman Turkey. And 
it's a breach of contract. And so you sue on that breach of contract, and there's nothing more than that. But then the question is, what do you sue? And then you don't have to be a lawyer, and you said the word 75 years or more. What about statute of limitations? You know, how do you deal with that? You can, you know, there's only a certain amount of period that you can file. All these were very large obstacles uh, in the litigation. But the lawsuit was filed in the United States. It was filed as a class action lawsuit. Um, the New York Life um, did what every other uh, large company that was sued always does. You And I'll say it quaintly, they lawyer up which means you get um, some very big law firm to defend you. And they went in and they filed a motion to dismiss before the federal judge saying dismiss this case. And um, the federal judge looked at it and said, you know what, I'm not gonna dismiss it. I think it has some possibility. And at that point, New York Life, I wanna say to its credit, um, said, let's, let's deal with it. Let's see if we can settle it. Uh, we're not going to talk about law. We're not going to talk about uh, you know, a legal piece. We're going to talk about moral piece. And so they began negotiating. They were not successful. Um, the litigation broke down. But eventually, there was a second round of negotiations. I mean, you know the more details on it than me. I was involved in that. I was just reading about it in the papers. And there was a, a successful settlement um, where New York Life uh, ended up settling the litigation, started a fund, and the fund would, uh, was then distributed um, to the claimants who were actual policyholders and went also used for general relief, just like it was done in Holocaust restitution. The same thing was done in the Swiss bank litigation against the Swiss banks, where a fund was started. Uh, and it's to help the destitute, help, help the, the heirs uh, for the Holocaust, the, the still few Holocaust survivors. Um, and that kind of opened the gates of litigation, the flood of litigation. Um, and other losses were Holocaust restitution losses were filed um, by other lawyers. And other Armenian genocide litigation losses were filed. I mentioned about the lawsuit with the Angelic base, the lawsuit against Getty, um, against um, for Armenian you know, religious manuscripts that they happen to have in their collection, torn from an Armenian you know, Bible, the Zaytun Gospels. You know, the actual Bible is in the Marataran in Yerevan, and the pages are in the Getty, and the church claimed it belongs to them. Um, other litigation was pursued. Um, unfortunately, that litigation uh, was not successful the Getty case settled. But the other cases, here's where the political component came in because the US government um, came in in all of these cases, intervening these cases, saying that having this litigation being heard by American courts interferes with our foreign policy. And they were basically talking about Turkey. And you know, just mentioning the G word, genocide, where the Lemkin, you know, invented and used and applied it to the Armenian genocide and to the Holocaust. Sama became, you know, a the word that must not be said, otherwise it cannot be heard. And just like, you know, our president will not say the G word on April 24th, um, it's something that if you make this an Armenian genocide case, uh, judges are saying, well, that's a political question, or they find some other reason to throw the case out. We think that's completely wrong. Uh, there's still some possibility some of those cases might be overturned. Um, there might be other cases that might be filed uh, against other entities, maybe even against Turkey, maybe against uh, other museums, um, other individuals that hold um, stolen loot, stolen booty, stolen, you know, uh, Armenian uh, religious objects, art objects that come that were stolen from the Armenian genocide. And that um, unfinished genocide 
justice, something that still exists now more than 100 years after the Armenian genocide you know, and more than 75 years you know, after the Holocaust. And I mean, just in reference to the challenges or the limits, the statute of limitations wouldn't necessarily be an issue, or of course it was an issue in the suits that I was involved in during my time at the, the office, but it is interesting that perhaps it may interest uh, people who are watching that even with the passage of time, it's not an immediate bar uh, to prevent cases from being filed in the, the court system here. Yeah, the, the actual answer to this is as follows. If there's a statute of limitations, um, in other countries it's called the prescription period. So you might be aware of that, you know, uh, that term. The prescription period, a judge looking at the situation can say that that prescription period has been told. You know, the clock has been stopped because either the claimants were not aware all these years that they had a claim um, or they were just unable to file that claim. And so just like in the Holocaust restitution cases, um, until Germany became unified in the 1990s, you could say you couldn't file a lawsuit against German companies because technically, you know, the, the war had not ended until unification of Germany. Um, and with regard to the Armenian insurance litigation, those claimants were not aware of these claims or if they were aware of these claims, they just could not even imagine that you could file a lawsuit on that behalf. So the judge in that case said that th there is a good chance that those lawsuits, the statute of limitations for that breach of contract could be suspended or told and in the interest of fairness. Because what is the reason for having a statute of limitations in the interest of fairness, right? Uh, so we ask, is there a statute of limitations for murder? No. If you find someone that in their 20s murdered someone, but they're 95 years old, you can still put them on trial for that murder. You don't say, well, it's too late. You can now live out your life. But for civil litigation, well, you're asking for money, restitution, a monetary award. There is a time by which any lawsuit you know, could be stopped for statute of limitations unless it's unfair to do so and it's more fair to allow the litigation to proceed. Right. And I remember reading in your most recent book how others in the United States have also tried to push for, uh, tried to file lawsuits for reparations, whether it's, I think, descendants of the Herero Nama peoples who were subjected to genocide very right at the beginning of the, the 20th century by Imperial Germany. And also, I think African Americans have also tried to take similar steps in, for reparations for arising out of slavery. So clearly those issues uh, come up even with the, pa again, with, despite the, the passage of time. Yeah, the Herero genocide in Southwest Africa in 1904, um, there were two, um, separate sets of lawsuits filed by the descendants came from South Africa, filed the suits, but they were, um, they were unsuccessful so far, both set of lawsuits. So let me use what you just said a moment ago, Professor, to pivot to a slightly broader theme, and namely the, the international safeguards and mechanisms that are in place today to protect the rights and well-being of others. How would you evaluate the ability of the international community in the period following the end of the Cold War to enforce mutual obligations to protect the human rights, especially in light of atrocities many of us witnessed in places like the former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, now Syria and Libya? How effective have they, have they been in upholding these ideas, which I think really emerged in the, the post-1945 uh, global order? Our generation failed. Um, I made that statement at the beginning in order to make a point. Um, the dreams of those who created the Nuremberg Tribunal for individual criminal responsibility, for those that talked about never again, 
not just to the Jewish people, but never again, you know, atrocities anywhere else in the world. Um, did not, who created the United Nations, um, a more effective international body in the League of Nations, um, did not think that we were going to be repeating this. So never again became, and again and again and again. Um, so I always tell my students, the next generation of leaders, and my children too, that you have to do a better job that, than we have done. On the other hand, um, the dream of, uh, let's call it from the American point of view, the greatest generation, you know, the people that fought in World War II, and what they died for and what they tried to, was not extinguished. So that in the 1990s, after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, there was more unanimity before the Security Council. And the Security Council was able to create the successors courts to Nuremberg. So Nuremberg was an ad hoc court. It was 1945 to 1946. It disbanded the formal name International Military Tribunal. In 1993, the UN Security Council created the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And in 1994, it created the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda to deal with genocide and other atrocities that took place in those two parts of the world. There were also some mixed tribunals created. There was a tribunal created for the killing fields in Cambodia. And in fact, uh, you probably know that the, um, the chief prosecutor, the last chief prosecutor uh, for that tribunal was uh, Nicholas Comgen, who's an Armenian American lawyer, right. Right. Went, who went to Cambodia to, to be the chief prosecutor. Um, so it's still alive. The sparkle is alive. You know, uh, Lemkin, after World War II, uh, after coining the word genocide in chapter nine of his book, um, his dream was to create an international treaty to make genocide illegal and to prosecute those individuals who are uh, perpetrators of genocide. The French word is, you know, the, Genocidaires. And he was successful in that. In 1948, um, the Genocide Convention came into being. Um, excuse me, I, January, sorry, on December 9th, the Genocide Convention came into being. On December 10th, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights came into being. And December 10th is. Um, today recognized all over the world as the International Human Rights Day. I would say with pride that my daughters were all born on December 10th. And um, I just wanna, for this video only, you, know, you can cut this out, but I'm gonna put this in the video, okay? <laughs> I'm gonna show you a photograph of my daughters. They're triplets. I'm they not cutting now, it out. I'm not cutting it out. 14 years old. Okay, and this is a photo of them. And they are, do you see they're in Amnesty International bags? Okay, because right after they were born, I was, went to a conference of Amnesty International where I'm speaking about the same subjects I'm speaking now. And I made them card carrying Amnesty International members because they were born on December 10th. So there you see, there they are in their AI bags. Uh, my sister and I are putting their names on top of it. So I already was steering them in the right direction <laughs> yeah. for what, what I want them to do. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that they very much are political aware, um, talk a lot about climate change, talking about uh, how the world needs to be better and, and see um, what the next generation needs to do that we fail to do. And... Perhaps we can also use that to transition to current events and, of course, uh, the ongoing war between the Armenians and Armenia and Artsakh, or better known internationally as Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan. This is always an issue that comes up and has come up ever since I started reading about it and learning more about it. 
of the issue between territorial integrity, which is what Azerbaijan always tries to uphold and uh, defend its interests in that way, uh, versus self-determination, which is, I think, a notion which really arose during the, the last years of the First World War when Woodrow Wilson heralded its preeminence as a, uh, as a principle to govern the new political order. And of course, the, the Bolsheviks, I think, may have even been using that kind of terminology during the, the years immediately before the First World War too. In, and they had their own formulation of going about it as well in terms of allowing a population to decide what it wants to do. How would you characterize the tension between these two seemingly uh, what's the, the best way to term it? You know, they seem to have a strength, equal strength, and it's almost always impossible for one to trump the other unless there is some sort of international intervention which forces or imposes a, a different solution to it. Yeah. Let me answer it this way. My first answer is stop. Stop killing innocent civilians. Stop fighting. Right. If if you know if civilians on the Azerbaijani side are being killed, that needs to stop. If c civilians on the Armenian side are being killed, stop. Okay. This is what the dream was um, of those that created the post Nuremberg world order. Everything that if, if any of that is done, that is illegal, and the individuals that are doing those or directing others to do, okay, are international outlaws. They are what is called in international law, I'll use Latin, hostus humani generis, outlaws against all mankind. And there's a possibility that those individuals can be brought to justice, to the international criminal court, and they can be indicted and then can be taken there. So stop, stop because you might end up in jail and stop also because innocent should not be killed. Number two, unfortunately, when you are dealing in that part of the world, just like in other parts of the world, the other big power nations come in and they start playing a role and they end up creating, aggravating the problem because of their own self-interest, whether that's Turkey or Russia. And it's something that uh, stops um, a ceasefire uh, or provides um, moral or even military support for the belligerents that are facing each other uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, or around Nagorno-Karabakh, or in Armenia, or in our, you know, proper Azerbaijan, of fighting. And it stokes the fire. And that has to stop. Um, any of these conflicts, you know, can be resolved. If we're talking about the height of uh, what was going on in the former Yugoslavia, with the Serbs and the Croats and the and the Bosnian Muslims, I can bring out my history. You can bring out your history. We can argue about it. We can talk about past injustices, um, but ultimately has to be resolved. How was it resolved? The Dayton Accords. President Clinton got the parties together, and he's he was able to put together a peace settlement, and that peace settlement has stood. It's never a perfect peace settlement. You know, the you know, Bosnian Serbs and the Bosnian Muslims are not hugging each other, uh, and I'm generalizing now, right? But they're living in peace. Right? People are not dying, civilians are not dying. You don't have ethnic cleansing They're going around. So all those solutions are possible. Um, you know, and, and so the, I'm just, I feel so sad, 
so sad as to the, you know, the war that is going on right now, the conflict that's going on right now. So that's why I first say stop. And um, it has to go down to diplomacy. And so the question is, how long do we have to wait? You know, uh, let me say this way. Um, and I'll put an analogy to something that also is very near and dear to my heart, um, which is the Middle East conflict. And people ask, when will the Middle East conflict stop? And I heard many years ago, um, someone being interviewed, I think he was a lawyer. And he said about the, you know, the fights between the Arabs and the Jews and you know, for that piece of territory in the Holy Land. Uh, we don't know okay, when it's going to stop, but we do know that innocent people are going to be killed between now and when it stops, right? So everybody knows the solution. There's going to be a solution at some point, um, but until good people from both sides come together and um, gets into some kind of settlement, um, it's going to be so difficult. You know, um, Prime Minister Rabin said, Israeli Prime Minister, you don't make peace with your friends, you make peace with your enemies. And that's what needs to be done. I'm not a diplomat, I'm not a politician. I'm just a professor in every tower and a human being that looks for a better world. So I'm giving you, you know, my input here from my heart and my soul. Thank you. I mean, like you said, it's, something which all of us are earnestly hoping for, uh, uh, immediate cessation to the hostilities and uh, end to the killings. And we can only hope for it to be wound down as soon as possible and to never see it resurface, uh, at least in, you know, in anybody's lifetimes. Okay, so that brings an end to the questions that I had, at, in, at least insofar as your expertise was concerned, Misha, but maybe I can ask you one or two miscellaneous questions. One of them was revolving around our dear departed friend Varkis, and I was wondering, is there any memory or anecdote that he may have told you which you remember very fondly or recall very clearly? Gosh, what an interesting person. An Armenian born in Ethiopia. I never met an Armenian that was born into the Ethiopia. Who <laughs> tells me? I think you you might know more details that his family was somehow advisors or worked with the royal court of Haile Selassie, something like that. Um, I think he had a an uncle on his mom's side who was the the royal dentist to Haile, Emperor Haile Selassie. But there was a number of, I think there's a number of individuals who, and from his family, who held some positions in their government. Right, right. Uh, but you know, all of the time, just Vikas's passion. I mean, when we all got together, um, yeah, you saw it. You know, every day, um, you know, when you were working with him, I only got to see it on the times that we had all those wonderful lunches. You know, at the Armenian restaurants. Phoenicia and Glendale. <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I carry him in my heart. You know that we talked about this a lot. I, I miss him very much. And he's an inspiration, you know, to me. And every time I speak about the Armenian genocide, I have an opportunity to do so. Or speak about just in general, I try to bring him up. Um, there are two people in my life that are inspirations. Um, one is the late Vatka Sagayan. And the other one is Benjamin Ferenz. Ben Ferenz is 100 years old. He's the last living Nuremberg prosecutor. Um, and uh, he was the chief prosecutor of the generals, the German generals, the SS generals, who were responsible for the killing of over 1 million Jews in the Soviet Union over those killing fields. He was an attorney 27, uh, had never tried a case in his life, graduated from Harvard Law School was on the Nuremberg Tribunal uh, and the Nuremberg staff. He's still alive today. And Ben always ends his presentation with the following words. He says that, that there are three things to remember. I'm gonna end it just like Ben Ferenc. One, never give up. Two, never give up. 
and three, and then he stops and says, he allows the audience to say it the third time, never give up. <laughs> Yeah, like you said, uh, those of us who, who knew Varkas will always retain a part of him in, in our hearts. And your friend Ben also sounds like a, a wonderful person as well. So, of course, the, the, the first part of this show is supposed to be Hollywood and history. But again, in these interviews, it always comes toward end. I was wondering if you could provide us with any favorite Holly, you know, favorite films that you have, Misha, or you can even talk about these films which have appeared in the last couple of years on the Holocaust. Of course, uh, not just the Holocaust itself, but also the topics of restitution or justice. Woman in Gold, which is about the, the Altman versus Austria case, which is, of course, about a, a woman who escaped Nazi occupied Austria after the occupation in 1938 and sued in, again, California courts to get back uh, this very marvelous painting by, oh gosh, I, I forget the- Gustav Klimt. Gustav von Klimt, yes. Yeah. yeah, paintings that belong to her family that had been seized by the Nazis. And also the film Eichmann, which uh, I think it was titled Eichmann, right? With Ben Kingsley, who plays the, Michael, you, you saw that film, I haven't seen it. Yeah, I can't remember what it was called. Uh, I mean, I can Google it right now. But uh, if you have seen those films, Michael, I think you have seen uh, Woman in Gold. What was your take on it? I thought it was a good film. In fact, I have I teach civil procedure to first year students. And Randy Schoenberg, um, the attorney, the real life attorney played by Ryan Reynolds, um, is going to be speaking to my class tomorrow um, you know, on that case specifically. And I've encouraged all my students to watch that that movie. Um, obviously, I recommend The Promise um, for the Armenian Genocide. Mm -hmm. um, um, we're very lucky, you know, all of us, with all this content that's available, streaming, you know, that's out there to watch. I think it's such an important part of the educational process uh, to do uh, and to have those. And documentaries, I think those are good to for people to watch and to bring um, those home. There's some very good documentaries on the, on the Eichmann trial, um, not just the film, you know, that was um, made, um, you know, recently. Um, and um, it seems like Hollywood very much uh, is interested um, in making films about those events. What's interesting about the Holocaust, um, is that most historical events, you know, the longer their time goes by, the less they're remembered. Um, Hollywood seems to remember the Holocaust more and more you know, as time goes by. Uh, and these films and, and actually more than Hollywood and books, stories, um, people really wanna hear about them. They wanna watch it. Uh, they wanna know more about it. Um, you know, genocide, you know, the called the crime of crimes. That's the term that was coined by the Rwanda Tribunal when they were prosecuting the first genocide case. So I think the, the nature of evil and how to hide evil, fight evil, um, how do good people allow evil um, to happen? Um, highly recommend watching any documentary on uh, Elie Wiesel uh, was a Holocaust survivor who became the voice of the Holocaust survivors. Mr. Wiesel died recently. I had the good fortune to meet him a number of times because he used to come to Chaplin University, the Holocaust Center. And he also, he didn't talk about just the Holocaust. Um, so when um, the Holocaust Museum was uh, inaugurated and he was asked to speak, um, he turned to President Clinton because at the same time, a genocide was going on in the former Yugoslavia. And he said, I'm paraphrasing now, Mr. President, I cannot keep silent. I must talk about this. Uh, when we see other people um, that are victims and that the United States was not doing you know, anything about it. Um, so activists like that, you know, people that are not um, bystanders, I mean, you know, the term, upstanders, 
who will not be silent. Um, any of those films, uh, documentaries, books, I would recommend. Thank you. And by the way, the, the name of the Eichmann film was uh, Operation Finale. It came out in 2018. And okay, uh, other Michael, I can leave the, I can turn the questions to you if you have any. We always save, Armin always saves me for last. And I, I have a thousand questions, but I'll keep it to like three or four and probably hopefully they won't be too long. But first, I, I have, uh, I have a, a special place in my heart for Chapman University. I personally didn't go to film school, but about 20 years ago, before I got my foot in the door in Hollywood, I had a good friend that was getting his master's in film at Chapman University, and he recruited me to help him on his short film. I was his, his producer, his assistant director, his, his uh, production assistant, and, I, and that was, I always refer to that experience as my film school. Um, you know, it was about a, about a 20, 25 minute short film, and I was location scouting and doing whatever, getting bossed around by my friend and uh, learned a lot. And then I got my foot in the door and ended up having a career in Hollywood. So uh, I Bravo. Kind of special, Bravo. Yeah. So Bravo. Chapman University. Bravo. Go Bravo. Chapman. I, yeah. We're, you know, Michael, we're very proud of in school. I will say that since the time that, you know, you had a connection with it. Now, the reputation of the film school has skyrocketed. I'm not just saying this myself. I've talked to UCLA and USC film students or NYU. And when I mentioned Chapman, you know, it, it's not an Ivy League school. It's not a UCLA or USC. If they're in the film business or the film school, they immediately mention the film school. So I feel very, very much, you know, pride. I can also add that our law students have gotten together over with the film students and have actually gone and made films over the, the summer in places like Uganda, um, wow. other countries, about you know some of the human rights issues that are there. Um, so I think there's a, a nice, when you have lawyers, law students, film students coming together, um, they can really do such, such amazing work together. So kudos, keep doing that. I, do a film production. I think we even have a film studio now. It should happen. So contact them. <laughs> well, I, uh, I agree with what you just said about when those different disciplines join together, you know, law students. And for me, it's, it's the same experience. It's, it's historians. It's, it's going through archives and researching the facts. I mean, that's what a lawyer is supposed to do and f research the facts. And, you know, I've got Armin and a whole team of historians that have opened my eyes and to the facts of history. And as a storyteller in Hollywood, I, I can't, I haven't come across a more compelling narrative than what actually happened to Sogum and Tolerian. Like you don't have to make anything up. It's all like the facts of history. Um, so I often wonder, and I don't know if you can shed light on this, but the United States didn't enter world war two until Pearl Harbor, right? The, the 1941 and the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor. How, how prevalent or how, how widespread was the knowledge in the United States of what was happening to the Jews? You know, we didn't join the war while they were being massacred early on, like two years go by. Was it, what was the, what was going on in the United States at that time? Sure. Question. Let me point out something, show you something. So there's a book um, called, it's an index. And it's called the Index to the New York Times Articles on the Holocaust from 1933 to 1948. See that? So you can actually go and find the dates of the articles and the titles not the articles themselves. And then, you know, you can do a Google search and New York Times search for any particular articles. The answer is that we knew, um, or the world knew a lot, uh, but the world didn't want to believe it. And then um, also the, uh, the actual, you know, um, factory murders that started taking place, the industrial murders, whether it's in the, open killing fields um, or in these human slaughterhouses like Auschwitz didn't begin until 1941 after we entered the war. 
But even after we entered the war um, and, and we knew about it, we didn't do as much as we could have. Um, one of the issues with regard to the um, Holocaust is why didn't we bomb the rail lines uh, that were going to Auschwitz? Um, you know, next to Auschwitz, there was an industrial factory where e, um, IG Farben, you know, was doing war production. It's a private corporation, you know, the largest chemical company in the world, largest corporation conglomerate in, in Germany. But they were right there next to Auschwitz because they were able to requisition slave laborers from the SS. And American bombers actually went and bombed that factory, but didn't bomb the camp. And Eli Wazell talks about the fact that he was in Auschwitz at the time, looking at the sky, you know, and seeing, you know, his liberators or people, mm -hmm. and you know, they they didn't bomb the gas chambers. Why didn't they do that? Um, that still is is a controversial issue. Um, Roosevelt's policy was let's end the war as quickly as possible. That's the best way to save the Jews, and people did not really believe the extent of the killing until afterwards. Uh, even those reports that came out, people that came, there was a Polish diplomat, Jan Karski, who went and met with President Roosevelt and told him, you know, I sneaked into Auschwitz. I can tell you what's going on. Roosevelt didn't want to believe it. She, uh, Justice Felix Frankfurter, who was um, Jewish and was on the Supreme Court, he met with Jan Karski. And he said, and I can't quote it exactly, but he says, what you're telling me, I'm paraphrasing, is the truth, but I cannot believe it. You know, it was just something that, you know, as human beings, we couldn't wrap our mind around, you know, the massive killing that we as human beings can do to defenseless people on such a mass scale, whether it's in Ottoman Turkey or in, you know, Nazi-occupied Europe. Uh, and that's obviously is the problem today. You know, I'm a law professor, so I apologize. You, you, you ask a question, I can give a whole lecture, right? But we oh, can I talk about it. today. You know, yeah. we just, we see this stuff on the news, right? And it's right there and it's coming at us. And we want to turn our eyes and we, you know, we don't want to believe it. You know, no, it can't be true. And I, I feel like actually Hollywood, you know, my profession is is partially responsible for desensitizing people. Like we see, you know, every great action movie has these horrific villains and we just tend to think, oh, that's just a Hollywood villain. But there are actual actual villains that do horrific things to people today, like every day and today. And we just t turn our eyes or it doesn't affect me or I don't know. We, we live in a bubble and don't want to get out of it, I guess. All right, I, I, one last question. Um, I usually, Armin usually saves the, the, your favorite movie or movie recommendation, but you already made those recommendations. He usually saves that question for me, but he asked it. But here's my last question. And I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with the, the, the political stance or, or the argument why uh, the presidents of the United States make promises that they'll recognize the genocide and then break that promise because of, you know, the Turkey's strategic location and our alliance or whatever. Um, I understand that, but I'm, I, I'm going to put a hypothetical to you. Let's say it happens. Say that finally, whether it's Trump or Biden in the, in the near future, does it and, and officially recognize the, the genocide. And I'll even go one further. Let's say the president of the United States recognized sovereignty for Artsakh. Speculate on what the ramifications for those actions would be. I don't know. That's a, you know, it's a hard question. You're asking a very intelligent question. I don't know. I don't know what the details of it, but I know that um, the people there can live in peace. Look, uh, the reality is this. Um, I may be off point on this, but then stop me. The people are living there. You know, there is a portion of Azerbaijan, as Azerbaijan is recognized by the rest of the world, you know, where you have a majority Armenian population, right? That's not a unique place. There are other places in the world what that occurs. And 
people can still live in peace with each other. Um, so the details of it are all workable, whether it's, uh, you know, an autonomous territory or however you want to call it, or it, it can be done, you know, that people can live in peace, you know, with each other. I remember having a chaplain speaking the first Arab justice on the Israeli Supreme Court. You know, 20% of the population of Israel is, is Arab. And he, he, he comes from Haifa. And he says, in the apartment building where I live, you know, we have Arabs, we have Jews, we have Christians. And he says, not only do we tolerate each other, we celebrate each other. You know, they invite me for Hanukkah. I invite him for, you know, for Christmas. Another, you know, Arabs, Muslims invite us for their holidays. That's the kind of world that I think we should be living in. Um, so I think that's that, that part, your question. The first part about the recognition, you know, the answer I remember that uh, Vatican is always a gift. What do you mean recognition? The United States has recognized the, I mean, in genocide, President Reagan recognized it. Okay. So, you know, to sort of, I, you can say it's not an issue anymore. You don't have to give that you know, failure to recognize or to say the exact word beginning in the G word in the proper language, you know, as the magic wand that all of a sudden now, says, oh, it's been recognized. You can put that away and say, no, it's not an issue. Um, or you can say, yes, you know, maybe the next president uh, or the same president in his next term, you know, will say the G word on April 24th. Uh, realistically, I, is it going to change the world by saying the G word or not? No. And even if the G word is said, is Turkey all of a sudden going to break diplomatic relations with the United States? No. Should the United States, should the president say it? Yes. You know, uh, but I, I'm looking at the bigger picture. You know, I, I have friends that are Azerbaijanis. Uh, I, they're wonderful people. Uh, I have friends that are Armenians. You know, I have more friends than Armenians because I just happen to live in Los Angeles. But I love Armenian food and I love Azerbaijani food. You know? And I've been to all those places. And I remember during the days of the Soviet Union, when I visited Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan, that highway, the friendship highway, one place, you know, where the three republics come together. That was an artificial peace. It was, you know, everybody was under the rubric of the Soviet Union. But people enjoyed each other. They lived each other. You know, there is, as I remember, a large Armenian population living in Baku. And I remember when I was in Baku at the time, our guide in Azerbaijan and Baku was an Armenian woman who was just happened to be Armenian but living in Baku. Well, I agree. Stop fighting. Live in peace. Just let people live in peace. Well, thank you for joining us. And I have a thousand more questions, but perhaps we can do that another time. Um, and thank you, Armin, for uh, bringing your, your dear friend to our, our little podcast. Sure. My pleasure. No fair. No fair. I don't understand. <laughs> well, let me say this. You know, in the Soviet Union, Armin knows this. And this is part of the propaganda, but it has... It has such place. The two most important words is mir and drujba. Okay, mir means either peace or world. Yes, and drujba means friendship. Friendship. Mir drujba. Yeah. All right. Good words to sign off on. Yes. Mir drujba. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. My pleasure. Take care. Bye, Misha. Bye.